Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Trident Talks. My name is Charlie Ryman. I'm the Director of Security Operations Recruitment here at Trident Search and super excited to welcome Kevin Robertson, who's the Head of Cybersecurity Operations and Defence at the Ardonna Group, who's also a veteran. Kevin, welcome. Thank you very much. How are you doing? Thanks for How are you doing? You yeah, okay? great, thanks. Yeah, good. 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 Enjoying the sun. It's actually beaming down on my face. Um, that makes a change yeah, in yeah. all the rain. Kevin, those who, for those who don't know you, would you like to give us a, a brief introduction into yeah. who you are, what you do, and, and how you got there? Uh, yeah, sure. So um, we go all the way back when I was, um, you know, I decided to leave school at 16. Figured I knew I knew best. Um, didn't want to go to university. Didn't want to do anything like that. You know, bummed around for a couple of years. Um, I was always interested in computers. You know, I was that 12, 13 year old boy playing video games 10 hours a day and, and that kind of thing. And, um, you know, that built me on a computer when I was like 13, et cetera, those kind of things. When I was 18, I decided, you know, I want to um, sort of leave home. I want to do something with my life kind of thing. Decided to join the, um, the Air Force. So I joined the RAF in 2009 and, and I, joined as uh, back then I think it was a uh, ICT technician was the, the job title I think now it's slightly changed like cyberspace specialist or something very fancy marketing wise quite um, handy, yeah 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 um, so I went for training in the Air Force which was you know basic training I think it's 11 weeks and then the trade training was 13 months something like that so you got to exposure to, to all kinds you know anyone listening who's obviously X RAF or X signals probably very similar and then after that, I was posted to um, 90 Signals Unit and Tactical Communications Wing there, um, which is, you know, kind of the Air Force's Signals Unit, I guess, uh, very similar to most of the Army Signals Units and, and the Navy equivalent as well. Um, at there, I was um, bit predominantly a network engineer. So we did a lot of stuff with some of the military bespoke equipment, um, but also bits and pieces with, you know, Cisco's, routers and switches. Um, and then towards the end of my time there in the last couple of um, years, um, I was started to become involved in the um, cybersecurity team and working with um, a JCU, so the Joint Cyber Unit um, down in, in, in Caution and Cheltenham. Um, and we worked on, on you know, certain projects that, that were um, you know, more security tooling related, um, but the kind of the deployable arm of that as part of TCW to take it overseas, take it on deployment, take it on debt. Um, when I started doing that, that's really where my sort of interest in cybersecurity, I think, was sort of was sort of born. I don't think I ever envisioned going down that route until um, that point in time, which was about 2015, uh, 2014, 2015. Um, but yeah, that was that was obviously very interesting. I decided to leave um, and I left in 2017. Um, as I was leaving as well, and I was looking for for roles, I found actually it was pretty pretty good. There was a lot of interest um, during my sort of transition period as well. The sort of last six months, I was very focused on self improvement and self study, and actually getting some certifications. So I got my CCN, my CCNA, um, uh, CCN secure, CCNA security shortly after that. Um, you know, did a lot of those kind of things. Um, I'll come on to a bit later about more about the certification self-study thing because it's quite important to me even now, you know, a few years in. But yeah, with that foundation, with that base, getting a CCNA, getting a CCNA security, I think that's served me very well. A lot of interest from um, recruiters. Um, and I managed to land myself a contracting gig at um, HP Enterprise at the time, which then became a DXC technology and a, a, as they still are today after a merger. Um, there I was a network um, Security engineer, network firewall engineer, um, to doing you know day to day management of their kind of um, internal network and stuff like that. It was quite quite a boring job. I'll be perfectly honest, quite a quiet job, but you know paid pretty good, right? Um, and 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 got me my first experience of sort of corporate lifestyle. You know, very very different to the military. Um, predominantly good, different. You know, I was working from home even then, so my I've worked from home now um, exclusively, pretty much for about. Um, for, for about four and a half, five years, I would say. Um, mm -hmm. So the the COVID situation, lockdown situation, wasn't too different for me. It was was not too bad. Then at the D, as DXC became um, they merged, um, our kind of bit was actually shut down, um, and my contract was terminated because AT and T, the big American carrier provider, they came in to cover that that role even remotely from the US. Um, 
it's all my kind of job plus got made got made redundant. So um, I then started looking for some more work. I did a lot of freelance stuff um, in my, in the spare sort of gap. So I did some financial services work and bank work um, for. Well, I won't name all of them, but Morgan Stanley, one of them, some banks in Scotland as well. I was in Glasgow at the time. Um, and a lot of that was based on, um, you know, firewall implementation um, and sort of security architecture at, at a certain level. Um, I certainly was nowhere near as experienced as I am now. You know, looking back, probably some of the stuff I did then, you know, there's better methodology and better approaches now. Um, but, but yeah, that was a number of years ago. Um, and then um, I started, I, I decided that as much as I enjoy contract, as much as there is, you know, um, good money in it and, and tax breaks and things like that, as, as I'm sure you're aware, I decided to um, look for a more permanent role. So um, what I did first and foremost, is I went for my absolute dream job, which I think any network engineer's dream job is, or so they think, is to work for Cisco. Um, and that was to work for Cisco as a network security engineer. So with a focus on their security portfolio, like Firepower and Cisco. Ice, um, Stealth Watch was coming in at the time, Titration a little bit later. Um, and, I, and I went through, um, honestly, about five or six interviews. Like the process there was, was very arduous. Um, and I actually was offered a role. So I got offered that job in 2017. Um, you know, very, very happy about that. That was, that was brilliant. So I worked at Cisco, um, Cisco UK um, in the UK for 18 months. Um, in that 18 months, especially the first six months, I would say, was very challenging. Um, so on my CV, for example, I put that I was experienced with VPNs and VPN, um, which is, wasn't a lie. You know, I did do that at um, DXC Technology HP Enterprise, but we did quite a small variant of it. You know, we're talking 10 branches, right? And my, I kid you not, my first project um, at Cisco was to work on at the time or or when it was um, introduced the largest DMVPN network in Europe and like top three in the world. So we're talking, I'd went from using 10 routers to 15,000, you know, overnight. Wow. So it was a very, very big jump. Um, and I had um, what I call in what's called the industry as imposter syndrome. You know, I was surrounded by people. Um, I was surrounded by, and I was reviewing the design of the person who wrote the RFC for DMVPN. Um, who then went on to help develop like V2 and Flex VPN and stuff like that. Um, luckily, during that project, I was involved with another um, a senior architect in Cisco at the time. So Graham, Graham Bartlett is his, his name, who has wrote a book as well on, on IPv2 as a protocol. So you know, go buy that book, great book. <laughs> a little plug there for, for Graham. Oh yeah, put um, a little plug in, yeah. Yeah, yeah but you know, so working alongside him was brilliant. That really helped my career. I think I got the mindset um, it was kind of like a mentorship sort of bit. I got to see how he sort of functioned as a kind of senior architect. You know, he's well known in the industry. It has been 20 years. Um, and that, you know, my, my sort of career progression there had been on this nice upslope in terms of my professional skills. Um, but it really started to, to go up then when I got that kind of one-to-one -one kind of um, relationship and mentorship. Um, so at that point, I decided to get my, um, just more certifications within Cisco. So I got um, CCMP written and switching, um, and I got my CCMP security as well. Um, I had ambitions to, to do my CCIE, and um, I actually passed the CCIE written exam, and I was due to take my CCIE lab exam, but then COVID hit. Um, um, I was due to take my exam last March, March 2020, and as you all know, that's pretty much when stuff shut down. The CCIE, CCIE labs were pretty much closed for almost a full year. Um, they only just opened up kind of at the start of this year. Even now, though, travel is limited. So if you have to take a CCIE lab, you have to go from the UK, you have to go to Belgium or Dubai or the US. And as wow. we all know, that is not simple. Yeah. You know, it's, a, it's an eight-hour in-person lab exam. You have to be on, on, on premise for it. So because I couldn't do that, I kind of just have kind of abandoned that. But, you know, we'll, we'll get on to why that was. Um, but I was at Cisco for, um, for three years. First 18 months in the UK, as I spoke about, and then the next 18 months actually were in, um, were in Qatar. Um, so I was kind of internally headhunted, I guess, um, just based on my background. You know, I was ex-military, which they value a lot in the Middle East. It's very much a credential thing. They like to hear that and see that on the CV. Um, and I 
was good was talking to customers and and and, and had no qualms with travel and all that so so yeah we relocated to qatar um and we spent 18 months in qatar and by we i mean me and my family um and that was also eye-opening um again a place that that i enjoyed being in um i we decided to move um at the end of last year um so i again i got super super lucky um i was working on a project um again can't go into detail but there was a um you know working on a project with a with a with the organization i'm with now actually as part of cisco um i was basically you know my i, I was leaving cisco at half past four that afternoon is when i kind of um you know made the decision and at 2 30 a.m that same day i got a phone call from the chief operating officer at, at our donna saying you know, we really need help from Cisco, Kev, we want you to come to this. And I was like, well, unfortunately, I really no longer work for them. Um, so I'm not the person to call. And he said, you know, screw that. I'll offer you a job right now on the phone. Um, offer me a contract to start, you know, as, as soon as I, I, I could, I guess. Um, so I got very, very lucky. You know, I was unemployed in quotation marks for less than 12 hours, you know, 10 hours, wow. whatever. Um, and so from there, I, I took a contract at, at Ardona, so um, as a security architect. Um, and it was helping their sort of transition um, in their sort of security um, landscape. Um, and that's very much still a, still an ongoing journey. Um, and what happened um, in, in January of this year is I was approached internally from um, our group CISO. So um, Janine, she's in charge of the entire um, CISO function for Adana. And she said, um, I guess, you know, we like the cut of your jib. How would you like to actually head up you know, cyber defense and operations, you know, for the, the whole kind of segment um, here. And I was like, okay, brilliant. So I went again, I, I made the switch from contracting to permanent. Um, and now I'm in charge of a, you know, small team. Um, we have, um, well, we'll have four analysts that work directly for me, um, but we have extended partners and extended relationships with IR firms, managed SOC, um, all sorts of services and stuff like that. So, so my day-to-day -day job now, is very much a managerial one leading the team, um, but I'm still an engineer at heart, so still get you know technically involved and, and things like that. Wow, uh, that. yeah, very really good. Background. Yeah, <laughs> it's good. It's good to get something that in depth for, for those candidates who are, who are looking to kind of get into into security. You can understand the the, top, the typical journey, um, which which is great. And you you mentioned quite a few times there that you, that you were lucky, but. By the sounds of it, you're always throwing yourself into roles that are challenging you and you identify those areas, you upskill yourself um, and you, yeah. you take on those certifications. And we'll talk about later, but certifications aren't the be all and end all, but they, they obviously do help a lot. So it's really good to hear. Um, so you briefly mentioned two things then. Um, one was around your, your transition. So some things that we see is some employers, it, they need candidates to have that kind of commercial experience. How did you find going, especially in, in the contracting, coming out, leaving mm. the forces, and then going straight into a contracting role? How long did that take you to adjust? Probably not that that long, actually. Um, like I said, the contracting role I went into was 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 actually quite um, quite low pressure, easy kind of work. I'll be perfectly honest. That's an sure. but Also, at the, at the time, I was telling my manager it's really busy, etc. But you know, it, it actually wasn't. I'll be perfectly honest. We had. Um, obviously, day-to-day -day monitoring and management of firewalls and stuff like that, and some project-based work and this, that, and the other. But it was really quite a quiet team, um, and there wasn't really that much going on. So I had a, again, a little bit of luck there, and that, that I did have time to find my feet and, and, and ramp up. And in terms of landing that role, um, obviously my certifications, I think, got me in the door. But every time I've interviewed for a position, um, which is has actually only been a few times, because I've been quite lucky to. Just move around internally, etc. The feedback I've always got is that I come across as someone that's got potential. Do you know what I mean? I'm always talking about in the in the interview I've been in is what else I'm doing, what my plan is, where I'm going. You know, not just going on the past. This is what I've done, and these are the certifications I've got. Give me a job. It's more about this is my past, these are my certifications, but also this is what I want to do in the future. You know, in mm. three years' time, I want your job. In four years' time, I want to be a CISO. In ten years' time, I want to be the CEO of a company. That kind of thing. Yeah. And that's what I look for in a candidate now as well. I did a lot of interview stuff, even in Cisco, because even in Cisco, we do a lot of hiring of um, like on-site engineers. So we'll do the high-level consultancy work, and then we'll 
hire an engineer to be the day-to-day contact, maybe a, a, a company or a government or a large financial service institution, something like that. So we did a lot of entries there. We need the right person for the role there and, and not quite the same. You know, we're not looking for to develop someone. It's That's more of a day-to-day job. Um, but now as part of our Donna, um, probably over the last um, four months, I've done uh, at least 30 interviews, I would say. So so quite, quite a lot. Um, I get called in as kind of a technical referee for um, even other sections, um, sort of interviews sometimes as well. Um, and so, and one, and I have a maybe slightly different interview technique than others, but I focus on people's strongest suit or so it comes from from their CV. So, if on your CV you tell me that you're an expert in network engineering and then you have a CCIE, I will spend ten minutes asking you questions about that to actually garner is that is that the truth because the way that i see it is if you've got the get up and go and the experience and the drive to go and get something like a ccie and become an expert in something you you can transfer that skill set you know you can easily learn other elements and things like that you know you can teach a, an old dog new tricks to, to, to coin yeah. them and i think that's something that people maybe don't realize you know if you're going to put something on your cv be expected to answer questions about it because that's yeah. what someone like me will do that's really some really good points that you made there. One around what people what people interviewed you liked was that you knew your journey, you knew where you wanted to go, um, and you're quite adamant with that. Um, so on that point, we sometimes have candidates who interview um, for for our roles, and they get asked, okay, well, where do you want to be in five years? And they they just get they get stumbled at this question, and it means yeah. okay, well, well, what are your true motivations? Um, so. You're right. If you are interviewing, you need to have a good idea of what direction you want to go in. And that's not saying, oh, in five years time, I want to be a CISO or something like that. It's just have a clear idea, whatever matters to you um, to annotate that within an interview. Well, exactly. I mean, if, if, if you don't know what you want to do, then how do you expect your line manager or your employer to, to know how to best utilize you? And it's the same if you look at if you look at any kind of elite sportsman or not in, not all of them, but the majority of them, um, if you ask them, you know, if you asked uh, Muhammad Ali at his prime, you know, who's the best boxer in the world? He would say, I am. And he'd be an ar- ar- a bit arrogant about it, you know. And, and that's the way I think people need to, to kind of focus. If you don't believe in yourself and you don't think that in 10 years' time you're going to achieve something, then you're not going to convince anyone else. You're not going to convince mm. the person that's interviewing you, you know. Yeah, that's, that's really good advice. Um, and then you also mentioned finding out what people do know. I think um, that's a really good way to go forward. You purely focus on where their strengths lie. Obviously, you want to find out where they're slightly weaker and then understand where they would fit within your team. I think um, there's too much people or too many people in the industry trying to identify what people don't know as opposed to focusing on what they do know and how they can benefit that. So again, that's really good. Some potential advice for for other hiring managers. Focus on um, what these candidates are good at and will they complement your team and do they have that scope to grow? I think it's sometimes a missed opportunity as well. I've certainly been in interviews where I've asked what I think are maybe easy questions. You know, for example, in a cybersecurity type interview, you know, have you heard of the Lockheed Martin cyber kill chain and what it is, for example? If that person answers no, okay, I'd be surprised because most people have an idea. But if they answer no, it doesn't mean they don't know anything. Maybe they're an expert in like a seam tool, like Splunk, for example. Maybe they know EDRs back to front. Maybe they can do IPS signatures off the cuff and stuff like that. I, you know, I'm more interested in what they do know. And if there are gaps, you know, we'll plug those gaps unless they're, you know, completely significant. Um, but I guess while we're talking about the interview process, um, I tell a lie. Uh, focus on someone stronger so it isn't the first thing I do. Um, I also set the foundation. So, again, if you've got a number of certifications and experience um, and you believe you're at a certain level, that doesn't mean I won't ask you, you know, how does TCP work? Um, how does HTTP work? How does, um, you know, like a very base level protocol work just to garner that you have that base level not what is the osi similar model how does it work you know sometimes i think people maybe either they don't know the basics or they forget them or they don't think they're important but 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 they are and they, they are the foundation of most things um networking and um web screen. yeah we see those questions come up quite often um and you also mentioned imposter syndrome you can have negative um, connotations of this, but we're going to focus on, on the positives. What would be your advice to anyone who's currently going through that? You're in a role, you're sitting there thinking, gosh, can I actually do this? What would your advice be? Well, yeah, so there's a, I mean, there's a, there's a quote 
I, I don't know who attributed to, but it's, um, you know, never be the smartest person in the room. If you are, you're in the wrong room. You know, if you're the smartest person in the room and you're, you know, you're not going to learn anything off anyone else, right? You know, so it's a waste of your time in, in, in some fashion. Um, so if you have imposter syndrome and you believe you're surrounded by people smarter than you, better than you, more capable than you, you know, take advantage of it. That's all I would say, you know, ask questions, um, ask for mentorship, you know, pull one of your colleagues aside and say, look, I'm a little bit worried. I don't know about this. You know, can you help me out? You know, um, if you go ahead and self-study a, a concept, let's use DMVPN for my previous example, self-study that concept will take you weeks, maybe even months. You know, if you had a bit of one-to-one -one mentorship and pointing in the right direction and he helps you avoid going down rabbit holes and stuff like that, you could probably get to the same level that you would in two months in a week or two weeks with, with this one-to-one -one stuff, you know. So if you're if you're surrounded by people better at their job than you are, um, you know, capitalize on it, ask for advice, yeah. ask for help, use it. Yes, good advice. Simplify it for yourself, right? Um, I've yeah. you spend spend hours and hours trying to find out what a certain thing means. And don't as well, don't be afraid to, um, you know, don't try and pass the buck to them every time because you don't think you're capable. Um, you know, again, use that to better yourself. Great advice. Um, and on our, our last point then, um, around certifications, we all know they're not the be all and end all. You don't have to have a list of certifications as long as you're on to land a role. What certifications are out there right now that you would like to see on, you mentioned that you're hiring. Um, so if anyone's looking for a security analyst, I'll reach out to Kevin. Um, what type of certifications do you like to see and, and why? Why, did, why would they benefit an analyst? I have two trains of thoughts on this. So the first one is that I think it's very, um, very difficult to work or land a role in cybersecurity, um, let's say, without a background in something else as well. So I was a network engineer first and foremost, and then I became um, a, a security engineer, security analyst, whatever you want to call it. You know, there was a transition period. Um, you know, you don't go to becoming, you know, you don't go to school to become a CEO, right? You need some other career path to get you there. And I think security maybe has that aspect in it. Certainly in the roles that I'm looking for, because we're hiring more generic blue team security analyst roles, I'd like to see a background in something else. So whether that is network engineering, whether it is application development, whether it is whether, whether it has been a SOC analyst, you know, I think maybe a SOC analyst is one of those where you could um, get your foot in the door. But even to become a SOC analyst, think of all the, the background you need. You need to understand um, well, networking first and foremost, you need to understand basic programming and coding, um, you know, in terms of Linux, Windows, you know, there's so much background in there that, that, that really you would be better served off by having experience in that rather than just self-taught about it. So that's not an answer to your question, I apologize, but um, that's all I'm saying is sometimes previous experience is necessary. Um, in terms of actual certifications, um, okay, I could say that, you know, if you've got every single SAN certification going in your GSE, for example, brilliant. You know, you're going to earn six figures and, and do well for yourself. Um, but getting those SAN certifications are like free round of pop, right? Um, minimum. Some of them are in person. You have to travel to the US and all, all sorts, you know? So those are largely unfeasible, I would say, for the most people. If you've got those, great. Um, but they aren't the be all and end all. They'll get you past, they'll get you foot in the door, get you an interview, et cetera. But they're not you know, necessarily what I'm looking for. Now, if you're sat at home and you don't work for an organization, you can't afford SAN certs and you can't afford sort of other ones. So CCNA, CCNP, CCIE, those are great as well from a network engineering point of view. MCSC from Microsoft point of view is great. The Azure and AWS um, stuff is really great as well, especially the security focused ones. But again, most of those cost money. Um, the Azure ones, I think, are relatively cheap. I don't know about the rest. Those go a long way. But if you are sat at home and you think, you know, I, I don't have a job, I'm unemployed right now, or you're leaving the military, for example, in that transition period, and you're not ready to invest thousands of pounds in, in doing courses or getting certifications, is use what's out there, what's, what's free and what's cheap. Um, and by that, I mean things like um, Blue Team Labs Online um, or even the Security Blue Team certifications. I think the um, level one is 400 pounds and the level two is 1600 pounds. And that includes a wealth of um, training and the exam um, and all that. But that's not a lot of money when you really think about it. So those are great tools for security analysts and great search for security analysts. Even then, if you're not ready to fork that out, you've got the Blue Team Labs Online, which is, I think, eight pounds a month or eight, uh, sorry, 18 pounds 50 a month, that one is. And you can do a wealth of incident response and kind of SOC analyst sort of investigations, challenges, all kind of things. 
And there's other things as well. So there's like hack the box, similar kind of thing where you're actively trying to do pen testing. Try hack me is another one, which is brilliant, especially for beginners, um, because you can you know start from the very basics and it's more like a structured learning program. And um, there's a hack the box academy as well. There's bone, uh, there's pen test academy, there's bone hub, there's there's hundreds of them. Now those ones actually, I love when they're on someone's CV. So if someone t comes to me and says, I have done every single hack the box box to date. Um, I've done every single try hack people. I've done every single blue team labs online investigation. You will get a job. Like, you know, if you can prove that, I will hire you that day. And those are investments that you can make for, you know, tens of pounds, maybe hundreds of pounds in the minimum, you know? So stuff like that will go a long, long way, I think, in terms of they're not necessarily certifications, but they show a willingness to improve and a willingness to learn and certainly demonstrate technical skill better than, better than most of them. Yeah, amazing. Really good advice. Um, we're trying to attach some of those links to to this video. Um, so yeah, really really good advice throughout that that whole chat there. I, I don't um I don't work for any of those organisations, by the way. Just <laughs> are <you> sure? <laughs> Got yeah. the commission coming your way. Um, but um, yeah, really great, really great insight into into everything. Uh, finally, if if you were to rewind the clock, going all the way back before you joined the forces. Um, mm -hmm. If you didn't join the forces, what direction do you reckon you would have taken? Oh, I, I, I actually have no idea. I think I would have tried to land some kind of IT job, um, probably like help desk initially, or maybe mm. junior network engineer or something like that. In fact, I, I don't think network engineer because I, I, I honestly at that point I had no concept of what networking even is. Like that was a passion sure. found throughout the sort of military um, and out my my trade training. If I could rewind the clock only um, a little bit, let's say, I was in the Air Force for eight years, um, or just about eight years, and I don't regret any of it. Like, certainly valuable experience, but I would have maybe tried to make a transition a couple of years earlier. Um, mm. I'd have liked to have, I'd like to, you know, in a parallel universe, see where I would be today if I left, say, two years earlier. If I'd left after sure. only six years rather than eight years or, or whatever. Um, I think you get. Um, for those maybe listening who aren't leaving yet but thinking about it, you know, don't be afraid to, to pull the trigger. There, it, it's not that bad. You think in the military, and certainly lots of my friends are still in the military, and they're very scared to, to leave and pass up this this safe job. Um, you know, but I know people that are leaving who don't think they're all that great, and they're landing 40, 50k jobs. You know, it, it does happen. So yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a, lot, there's a lot of support out there. For, again, for those people that are listening and looking to kind of step away, even if you're not looking to get into security, there's a huge support network. Um, so if you are watching this, you've got any questions, reach out to myself or Kevin, and we can kind of introduce you to those. But Kevin, thanks so much for your time. It's been really insightful. Um, hopefully you kind of get out and go enjoy some of the, the good weather. We'll try. Thanks very much. Thanks for your time. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye.